We are uh, going to be looking uh, tonight, starting in verse 6 and going through verse 11, but we'll go ahead and start reading from verse 1. Uh, so just so you know where we're going to be at, I, but we want to read it in its context. So uh, Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1, if you want to follow along, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For, and here's where we'll start, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And Paul has been making uh, a very structured and logical uh, presentation of the gospel, first showing the need for the gospel, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and pointing out and making it clear that that uh, man has to find some way to be saved uh, apart from his own righteousness. And Paul asserts that that way of salvation is, is a righteousness that you can receive as a gift. It's not a righteousness you earn by your actions, but it's a righteousness that will be imputed to you. He uses the translated into English as imputed. The idea is that uh, you don't have the resources, your bank account is empty, but somebody else has the resources and they put the resources into your account. Imputed righteousness is it's not yours, it's been given to you and you receive it by faith. You don't deserve it, so it's by grace. It's received by faith. And then he, in chapter 4, uses Abraham as an example of faith and that this isn't something that's new, but it's the exact same thing that Abraham found. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham had, a, in a sense, an imputed righteousness when he was uncircumcised before the law. Before he offers up Isaac, before, I mean, it's just based on the promise of God. He believes God, and God accounts it to him for righteousness. And then in chapter 5, uh, because Paul, the gospel doesn't end just with me having my sins taken away. The gospel, is, the gospel includes me becoming exactly like Jesus. The Bible says, uh, and we'll see it in chapter 8 later in this, in this very book, that uh, God's predestined to conform us to the image of his Son. So he doesn't save us and leave us the way he found us. He saves us with unconditional love as we trust in him. But then because of that work on the cross, we're reconciled to God. We're no longer far away from God. And being far away from God, being ignorant of God, and being ignorant of God, being unlike God, well, God solved that problem. He brought us back near to God. So being near to God, I'm no longer ignorant of God. And no longer being ignorant of God, actually, I now begin to know him. And getting to know God, I start to become like God. I, Jesus says you need to be holy. Your holiness has to be more than the scribes and Pharisees. They have that kind of holiness that's produced by human energy. Wear the right clothes, say the right things, do it on the right day, act a certain way. Uh, of course, you can't do it 24-7 because no one can, but just do it when the people are looking and uh, they'll stamp your card and they'll, you know, you'll get the right amount of stamps and you'll be able to, you know, uh, in, in that group, prove that you're one of the excellent ones. It's just legalism. It's in every culture. And, uh, Jesus didn't come to do that. He came to transform us on the inside. And Paul, in chapter 5, as he summarizes his argument, he also is introducing us to what he's going to say in, in chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8, especially in these verses. He had, he had begun this in the first verses that we were talking about or looking at last time where he, he talks about tribulations. That we're, we have this relationship with God, but not only that, even in difficulty, we're expecting our character to change, and we're expecting something to happen inside of us, 
And he continues that thought in verse 6 as he goes back to the basis of our relationship with God. He's going to go between the basis of the relationship with God to the behavior, then back to the basis of the relationship with God, then back to the behavior and the effect of that. He says in verse 6 through verse 8, this very um, wonderfully worded sort of a, of, a, of a statement or you know, sort of an unveiling of a, of a logical reality. He said in verse 6 is a summary and then he, he kind of asks or makes some statements and then gives it the summary again in verse 8. But he says in verse 6, when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He says almost the same thing in verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There are three words in those two verses that he uses to describe us apart from Jesus. Without strength in verse 6, ungodly in verse 6, and sinners in verse 8. Without strength, ungodly, and sinful. Without strength means without any possible way that you could rescue yourself. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say. Uh, I can, you could say, well, let me put it like, how do I put it? I, you could say, Rich, it's impossible for you to dunk a basketball. And I would smile at you, and I would get a little trampoline, and I would show you that it's not impossible. Right? Right? It would be impossible for me without a trampoline, but I'm willing to bounce on a trampoline and dunk a basketball, okay? Or maybe when I was younger, maybe I wouldn't do it now. Uh, you know, you, you might say, you know, it's impossible for you to fly. Well, I'll go buy an airplane ticket and fly, right? There's certain kind of things, you, you know, you can say, well, it's impossible under these conditions, but if you could change the conditions, then it might become possible, right? There's lots of things like that. This is impossible, but the conditions change. It's now possible. This isn't one of those. When it says we were without strength, there is no condition that could change that would make it so that there's something that we could do that would be able to make ourselves safe. This is we're beaten, we're broken, we're defeated, we're, we're sick, we're, we have an illness that we can't, we can't be cured. That's the state of man apart from God, apart from this work of Jesus, is helpless and ungodly. And he's going to be talking about the work of God, and, and just as he's done already in his bigger argument in Romans, he starts with man's sin, and here it is in a smaller section, it's man's sin, ungodly, without strength, and sinful. Man, without being animated by God, without some power outside of him, without some goodness outside of him, some conquering force greater than man to enter into man. Like Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, that's an impossible statement again. It's not like, well, with the right glasses you can see it. No, you can't see it. You won't see it. You won't understand. Uh, he'll say this later in Romans. Uh, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't. There's no condition that you could remedy. There's no way you could change the, the circumstances. Well, if that's the case, but if you change this, then it could happen. No, it will never happen. Man's state is hopeless. He's hopelessly separated from God, and he has all the marks that he's hopelessly separated from God, controlled by sin. And so that's the, that's the condition that we're in. But the point he's making here is that it's in that condition that Christ died for us. And this is the practical part, as we read from verses 9 through 11, he's going to begin to stack these statements one on top. Like, if this, then this, and this, then this, and this, then this. The, the positive impact of Jesus being in our lives and of us experiencing the love of God. It's not just that our penalty is erased or that the shame and guilt of sin is taken away. It's that some new thing is beginning in my life when I give my life to Jesus. Some new thing, my life will be transformed. And he says that Jesus did this for us, dying for us, when we were hopeless, helpless, ungodly, sinful. And he says in verse 7, somebody, you know, scarcely, there's a chance probably that for a righteous man, someone would die. Jesus put it like this. He said, you know, greater love has no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. The highest honor that you can get in the United States military is what honor? 
called the, the Medal of Honor. And how do you get it? You generally get it if you're dead. Most of the time, it's, it's, it's honor to somebody who literally laid down their life. It, and, and something's happened in the battle. Something uh, horrific was about to happen. And some individual went beyond what anybody would think is reasonable, generally at his own expense or her own expense, to just lay down their life so that their comrades could live. And it's the highest form of honor that we have. The idea that somebody would lay down their life for their friend. We want to honor that. And that's a value, a cultural value. We say, man, that's you know, a mom for her kids, a, a dad for his kids, a husband for his wife, a wife for her husband. You know, the perfect, this beautiful love that I will sacrifice for you. This is the highest. Well, Paul's saying, yeah, someone might die for a righteous man. Someone might even dare to die for a good man, but God, verse 8, demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus wasn't dying for a good man when he died for me. He was dying for a blasphemer, an evil person, a totally, completely self-centered person, an arrogant person. But Jesus died for me. He died for my sins. It wasn't like he looked at me and said, well, there's something I can salvage here. I was helpless. I was hopeless. I was, I was uh, ungodly. But God demonstrated his love for me in that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. God's love is demonstrated. We can know that God loves us by the actions of God. You may have been hurt by somebody who told you they loved you, but then their actions told you something else. I, I'm guessing probably all of us have had some kind of a experience like that. Some of us probably very, very painful, maybe. Very difficult experience. Someone said, I love you, but then their actions, you thought, well, you were telling me you love me, you told me you love me, you told me you love me, but then your actions say you love yourself. That's heartbreaking. It's hard to overcome that. God tells us he loves us, but primarily God shows us that he loves us. He demonstrated it by an action. The action was, that when I was completely undeserving, Jesus took my place and took the penalty of an ungodly person and took the penalty of a sinful person and, and stepped in the place of the helpless person to be his help, to be her help, to deliver us. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, Paul's already made this point. That's been his point up to chapter 5. So chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's essentially he's saying the same thing. He's built that argument all the way through the middle of chapter 3. All the world's under sin, but God made Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins, and we receive it by faith. But now he's, he's summarizing it because he wants to say this. Look at verse 9. What, what are the words that verse 9 begins with? Much more than. Much more. Much more than what? Much more than the helpless, ungodly, sinful experiencing the love of God and being saved from their sins. Oh my goodness. Much more than that. How could you have to say it? There's nothing more than that. That's the most amazing thing in the world. Aren't you glad that you... Listen, if you came into church tonight, you felt guilty, and, thought, oh, and the Lord just started speaking to you. Just confess. Just confess. Open your heart. Let me, just let me wash you and cleanse you. Just be forgiven. Have you felt the weight of your sin lifted off of you? It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's the best. But Paul says, much more. I've, there is much more than that. We're not just saved from something. We experience life. We get saved from something so that we can experience life. We get saved from our guilt and sin, not so that we can continue to heap up sin and make a gigantic pile and have God keep saving us from it. We get saved from the guilt and shame of sin so that we can be reconciled to God. Two enemies that were far apart are now brought back together. Not only are we brought back together in pardon, but we're brought back together in intimacy where we, we can actually have a personal relationship with God. Much more than having, verse 9, having now been justified by his blood. And right, that's a review. That's chapter 3. You're saved, you're washed, you're cleansed from your sin by the blood of Jesus. Much more than having been justified by his blood. We did a whole Bible study on justification, right? So I'm not going to review it. Justified means declared righteous by the blood of Jesus. So it's justification by faith. We're justified by his blood. Then he says this. 
We shall be saved from wrath through him. Saved from wrath through him. Now, when you're studying the Bible, you want to pay attention when you come across a word that seems like an important word. This is the much more then, right? So what's the much more? Saved from wrath. What does wrath mean? You guys know Mike and Susie Wrath? No. He's not saying you're going to be saved from them. Saved from wrath? Well, when you're studying the Bible and you find a word that you think is a key word, you want to see, has the author of the letter or the book or the part that you're reading, have they used that word before and how did they use it? Okay? Has the word wrath occurred in the book of Romans? Yeah. Go back to chapter 1. The key verses of the book. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. This is the uh, sort of you know, theme of the book. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. Now, did you see the, the words of God revealed <laughs> already? Look at verse 17. The righteousness of God revealed. Verse 18, the wrath of God revealed. Now, when he says the righteousness of God revealed, is he talking about the future? No. He says the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The just will live by faith. I'm not ashamed that through the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. You're receiving it right now. There's, there's an alternative. The alternative is the wrath of God revealed. Now, normally when we think of the wrath of God, we're thinking of a final judgment, the lake of fire. That's true. But what he's talking about in the rest of chapter 1 is the consequences of living a life where you're far away from God. A, a life like we talked about on Sunday, a life where you don't listen to God. You know about God. You know what he says. You just don't listen to what he says. That's the wrath of God. You're going to be under the wrath of God if you don't listen to him. You listen to him and you, and you believe in Jesus. You've got the righteousness of God. It's come to you by faith. But he says the wrath of God is revealed. It is coming in the future. There's a, there's a terrible day of judgment coming. Jesus warned about it. He warned about a place of judgment that you don't want to go to. In fact, he said if your hand's causing you to sin, chop the thing off. You're better off living your whole life with only one hand and not going to that place than having both your hands and going to that place. The wrath of God certainly could be speaking about the future, but Paul, verse 18, in chapter 1, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. You see, when, when helpless, ungodly, sinful, like we saw in our verses that we read up to this point, and now much more than. So I'm, I was in that state, but I'm not in that state anymore. I'm saved from wrath. What kind of wrath comes upon somebody who's sinful? Well, they might go to jail. They might get a DUI and have their license taken away. They might ruin a marriage, or two, or three, or four. They might break the heart of their kids. The kids might grow up with a lot of pain. And they might be looking at their children and watching their children try to get married and watch the children's marriages fall apart and realize that I have brought the wrath of God because of my own disobedience into my family. And I, now it's impacting, I'm watching it affect, maybe affect my grandchildren. It's, it's the wrath of God. It's consequences of sin. We might be living in a time where people say there are no consequences of sin. You can say whatever you want. It doesn't mean it's true. Right? People can say this. That doesn't make it so. Just mouthing the words does not change reality. Paul says here, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. When men live unrighteously, it creates the consequences of sin in the society, in their personal life, in their psyche, in their own soul. Have you seen someone who gave themselves to unrighteousness? What happens to their soul? The darkness, the evil, the bitterness. And just, it's, it's like the heart, it, beca it becomes so dark and just only vile filth can come out. That's, 
That's God saying, and, he, and, he, and through the rest of the chapter, listen, if you don't want to listen to God, then God just pulls his hands back. That's part of the wrath of God. You, start to, you want the consequences and learn the hard way, then I'll let you learn the hard way. So let's go back to our... So that's, that's wrath. That's what we saw in chapter 1. Let's go back to our verses because we have the same phrase. Much more than... I'm saved from something. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. We're back Romans 5, verse 9. Having now been justified by his blood, we'll be saved from wrath through him. What does, he, what does he mean then? If we think of it the way Paul has already used it, the wrath of God that's revealed against what? Ungodliness and unrighteousness. I was far away because of my sins. Now I've been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so what happens to my life? God starts to speak to me. And he says, you can't talk like that. You can't let anger control you. You can't be unforgiving. You aren't supposed to let that lust go unchecked. You need to say no to yourself. You're not, and that's not the way to go. The Spirit of God now, He's living in my heart. Now I'm close to God. I'm reconciled. The thing that separated me from God was my sin, and that's taken away. I'm justified. I've been declared righteous, and I'm brought back together with God. And what happens is now I am being saved from wrath through Him. Saved from wrath. I just uh, did a funeral for my uncle. I mentioned that. I'm looking at Tom... And I, I remember Tom telling me the story of his father passing into heaven, surrounded by his children, singing a worship song, around his bed, all of his children around his bed singing a worship song. And when they finished the song, they looked down and go, Dad's gone. That guy's saved from wrath, right? Saved from wrath. What kind of wrath? Well, the wrath that happens when you live a self-centered life. Your kids are not surrounding you singing worship songs. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you have some of the wrath manifesting itself in your life? You got, a little, you got some consequences? A few uh, road rash marks from, you know, where you, you didn't listen to the Lord. You went your own way, and then boom, you, you, you know, the, the, it's, not, it's not as though God's bringing the punishment. It's just part of the expression of, listen, God is not going to uh, let you not have the consequences of your sin. God is going to let sin have its consequences in people's lives. And we get saved from that when we receive Jesus Christ. I've met people who are Christians, and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm always troubled with, and I haven't heard this for a long time, so I'm not thinking of anybody in particular, but I remember I've heard this many times over the years where someone says, oh, I just have to learn the hard way. And I, and I want to say, why? Jesus died on the cross. <laughs> he died on the cross, so you don't have to learn the hard way. Right? Isn't that what Paul's saying here? Much more than you've been saved by the blood of Jesus. You don't got to learn the hard way. You're saved from wrath. You don't, have to, you don't have to say, yeah, well, I didn't listen to God. And so I tasted, I, I went and experienced a whole bunch of consequences for my sin. Saved from wrath through him. And then verse 10, he's going to continue telling you what's the much more than. So first is saved from wrath. Then verse 10, if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So saved, saved from wrath, but now it's a little bit different. Still the word saved, but now it's saved in the life of Jesus, saved by the life of Jesus. So he said reconciled. So he's already, he's already made it really clear. You've received reconciliation. So he's not talking about the salvation from your sins. He's not talking about your reconciliation because he says, you're reconciled. So what kind of salvation is he talking about? Some of you need to be reconciled with family members. Some of you want to see a marriage healed. Some of you want to see a, a transformation of, of, you know, I live like this and I didn't make an impact in the world. Now I want to live like this. I want to see reconciliation happen. Salvation coming. See, he's not talking about salvation, salvation, like we think of salvation. If I say salvation, you're thinking, Jesus died for me, I'm reconciled to God. But look again at verse 10. We were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Okay, that's salvation. He now says, much more. So there's the much more again, same as in verse 9. Much more, we're reconciled. We're going to be saved by his life. What's he talking about? He's talking about what Paul calls in Philippians chapter 3, talking about very, something very similar, the dynamic of the, of the Spirit of God in our lives where he says, 
the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. That you can go through your life and say, Lord, what are we doing next? And you, and you have one event, and then you go into it, and, and then you go, all right, Lord, that was fruitful. Now what are we doing next? And your whole day can be a day of walking with Jesus, with the life of Jesus being manifested in you. Sometimes as you join in his suffering and say, oh man, I'm going to have to sacrifice right here. If you're telling me to do this, this is going to be real sacrifice. And I, maybe it's not going to, this isn't going to turn out how I want it to turn out for me, but I can see this is where I can sacrifice. This is what the Lord's wanting me to do. And I join with him in his suffering. Other times, it's very you know, positive and you know, rewarding, or whatever, like the power of the resurrection or the fellowship of his sufferings. It's the life of Jesus, saved. The salvation is saved from something, but it's saved to something. And really, Christianity is, is, is so positive. It, we're amazed because we, we, you know, we're saved from sin, and we understand that, and it's so wonderful Jesus died for us. But in emphasizing that, we forget that Paul keeps saying more than, more than that, much more. Much more is what? The new life that you have. The new life. You can have a brand new life. You live like this, you don't have any idea how you can live. All you know is the wrath part of life, where you just were selfish and lived for yourself. You don't have any idea how God might want to use you. You might be able to come up with an idea and see something from away as the Spirit directs you to see how God might want to touch somebody. I think of Steve and Kathy with their uh, ESL class, you know, just how much fun they have every week and... uh, Apparently, it's standing room only now. You can't get a seat. You got to, Steve's excited. Kathy's excited. Kathy knows how much work it is. Steve's just like, more people, more people for me to talk to. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you talked to Steve 15 or 20 years ago and said, why don't you teach an ESL class? He's like, well, I'm the last guy to do that. Now, Kathy would be ready, but... Uh, you know, who knows what God's going to do? Much more then. You got saved from something, but what m- much more? What, what did I get saved to? He says, we were enemies and we were reconciled. <laughs> now that you're reconciled, you're adopted. He put his name on you. You're his own kid. If you were an enemy and he rescued you and brought you into intimacy with him, how much more now this life of salvation, the life of Jesus, manifesting that you're saved, Positively, not saved from something, but saved to something. How God might work. I got a, I got a message today I wanted to share with you. I forgot, or it came yesterday, I guess. Um, I wanted to tell you to be praying for this, and this fits right here. Uh, Danae sent me a message from Ghana and asked for prayer. He says, we're praying for the right timing to start a church in Accra. Accra is the capital of of Ghana. We've had lots of students have lived in Accra. There's lots of wonderful churches and great ministries in Accra. Um, We've always seen wherever we've gone, there's a need for, you know, expositional Bible teaching. And we really haven't had uh, a model ministry uh, of our former students, really, in Accra. We've had some guys there doing good work, but He's had something on his heart, and he said, uh, the Lord has now provided a good place, uh, good enough for us to start a church, and this is the sign we were looking for. One of our former students has a plot of land in a good location in the craw, is putting it at our disposal with the option for her to build her house on the top floor uh, in the future, so pray for us. So I think he's obviously asking for wisdom, clarity in the relationship with this person who is willing to let the land be used, but with the condition, finances to do that, you know, the right, is this the right thing? But they were praying um, for a sign or some kind of direction. We would need to at least have a place. We can't even think about it until there's a place. And then someone goes, I've got a place. Now, I bring that up because Danae is not from Ghana. He's from Togo. He's from the country next door. He's a native French speaker. He didn't grow up. He he had English classes. He learned the grammar, but he really didn't speak English until he moved to Ghana and really didn't really speak English until he came to our school, Uh, even though he had studied it and knew the grammar. It's like some of us. We study and learn the grammar, but we don't say a peep of the foreign language. You don't feel comfortable with your accent or whatever. 
And he, he moved to Ghana 20 years ago to be a missionary to a small village on the border of Togo to teach French to the school children. That was his heart. Now he's overseeing a ministry that has over 2,400 former students, well over 100 churches spread across West Africa that all look to him for leadership. And now he's praying about God, you know, using those guys to plant a, a Calvary Chapel in Accra that someone's donated in the land. Uh, much more than. I mean, I know, I know Danae. He's very thankful Jesus died for his sins. <laughs> I've had communion with him many times. Uh, he's very thankful that his shame and guilt are taken away by the blood of Jesus. But just like you, just like me, much more shall we find the salvation that's going to happen in our lives because of Jesus' life. The life of Jesus means something to you practically. If you look at your life and you don't see the marks of the life of Jesus, then you need to take this verse to the Lord and let him take you behind the woodshed with this verse and maybe give you a couple of spankings with it. Lord, where's this life that's here? Much more than, I know I'm saved from, but where's this life in my life? Where is it? And he might tell you, well, it's because you don't ever read your Bible. Or he might tell you, well, because you're so stinking selfish. I told, I told you 10 times yesterday what to do and you never did it once. So I quit trying. Right? He may speak to you. But you ought to find the answer, because Paul says it twice, much more, much more. More than what? More than being saved from your sin. It's not the end. That's not the finish line. The life of Jesus. We're saved by his life. Then look at verse 11. And not only that, he sounds like a little bit like a used car salesman here. He normally, I would not say that about Paul. He never sounds like that, but you get a much more than, much more than. And not only that, you think like, what are you doing? Not only that, verse 11, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. So this much more than involves saved from wrath. It involves saved by his life. And now he says, we're filled with joy. We're rejoicing. If you're, if you're lacking joy in your life, you know where you find it? You've got to go back to the previous much more is the one we just emphasized we're going to find salvation as we experience his life as his life is manifested in us i can tell you probably who had the most fun at the every tribe and tongue event we had on sunday i can tell you who had the most fun the people who cooked and were there came early planned it out bought the food donated it cooked it talked with people i can tell you who has the most fun at everything. It's always the people who serve. They have the most fun. Now, that's not everybody, because sometimes I've been grumpy when I'm serving, and I'm not having the most fun because I'm in the flesh or whatever. But for the most part, Jesus said, you're more blessed when you give than when you receive. So we're rejoicing in Christ Jesus having received this, re this reconciliation because now I'm reconciled to God, and now I'm walking with the Lord. In the life of Jesus, I'm saved from something, but now in reconciliation, I'm experiencing the presence of God and he's inviting me into what he's doing. He invites me into someone else's life and said, this person needs a friend. This person needs help. This person needs some love. This person needs someone to sacrifice for them. Like you needed someone to sacrifice for you, Rich. Someone to come alongside you and love on you and help you. And then he can now take me now. I want you to experience my life. You're going to experience salvation in the life of Jesus as saved from but saved to. And that fills you with so much joy. There's nothing quite like it. I uh, got to talk to one of my cousins at the funeral. I'm just going to use that as an example because it's my most current event. So, uh, you know, when your family grows and you have the family that you grew up with, but then years go by and a patriarch dies or a matriarch dies and you have second cousins or third cousins. I had fourth cousins at the, at the event. And... Uh, I saw one of my second cousins. I think the last time I saw her, she might have been like four years old or something or less. Little, I think she was very small the last time I saw her. Now she's late 20s, really wonderful girl, very sweet, very uh, vivacious. It was really fun talking with her. And, uh, and the Lord really touched her in the message. And she came up to me and she said, uh, how do I, can do you have a podcast? Yeah, like, she goes, when you were talking, so much light was coming out of you. I just started laughing. I was thinking, that's a, that's a, you know, not what she said, but that out of this charcoal, that light could somehow 
like the black hole, you know, the event horizon where time ceases, you know, like can light escape? Much more being saved. How much joy? How much joy to be able to say, yeah, here we have an app. You can check it out. Listen to your cousin teach the Bible. Stacy, if you're listening, hi. I mean, I'm praying for her. She's telling me about her boyfriend that he grew up in church and had some things happen and kind of fell. He's like, he's, she said, he's wanting to get back into it. I've never really known about this. And I, she was, but when you were talking, I could understand what you were saying. Oh, what joy. What joy when you get to be part of the life of Jesus. Isn't it fun when you're talking to somebody and they go, you were my teacher all year. I've never had a teacher like you. What's the difference? You know, things happen like that, right? It may not happen. You don't know when it's going to happen, but it happens. And then you, you realize, I'm in the life of Jesus. This is the Jesus story being retold. Someone who was in trouble, Jesus went across the lake to help him, and I got to be part of it. Somebody who was lame, Jesus went and healed him, and I got to be part of it. Somebody that was troubled or didn't have the information, and they'd never heard, and, and, and Jesus was telling him, and I got to be part of it. So much joy. There's so much joy. Not only that, I think that's why he says not only that, as I think he's thinking about, it's not just that we're saved, because he's going to move into uh, walking in the Spirit, putting to death the flesh, you know, have, finding your identity in Christ. He's going to be talking very directly about the practical application of the gospel in our lives. I think we get a really, I think most people have a really good idea, it's saved from. But Paul spends just as much time talking about saved towards, saved to. And it brings him joy. Not only that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is it? He says that through him, we've now received this reconciliation. Reconciliation means the two parties are now together. We're now together. So you can live your life together with Jesus. You don't have to live it alone. You don't have to, you don't have to do what you want, how you want, when you want. You get to do with Jesus, what Jesus is wanting to do. And that's life. And that's joy. And that's power. You see, God loves us. <laughs> so he reconciled us. So he could save us from something, but he loves us, and he reconciled us so he could live our life with us, so that we could live our life with him. Prayer is not something that's formal or complicated. You don't have to worry about doing it right. Prayer is just simply you opening your heart to God and talking to Him about your life. If you're troubled about something, He wants you to talk to Him about it. And He promises when you talk to Him about the things that bother you or trouble you, He's going he's to take that burden and He's going to give you peace in its place. He told you that you can ask Him anything, any impossible situation in your life, you can talk to Him about it. And He said that He will, work, uh, he will, he will answer your prayer and he will do his will, and he will work something that you never would have thought happened, would have ever happened. When I was sharing the gospel with my family, I never, ever thought I would have that kind of clarity for my family to be able to share the gospel with them. I have a, a part of my, my, one of my uncles became a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't attend any other religious services from anybody else. So they don't, come, they, they don't come to the funerals, they don't come to weddings, they don't come to anything that has to do with anything that might, where someone might talk about God or pray or anything that's religious. So uh, I've not ever seen uh, my, my, her husband, who's, who's my dad's brother, he's, he's passed away now. And so my aunt was there, who's a Jehovah's Witness, and her daughter, who's a Jehovah's Witness, and her husband, they were all at the funeral. I didn't ask them why, because I didn't want to embarrass them, and I, did, I just thought, well, they're there. But I didn't notice them come in. And uh, I, you know, my whole entire life, every single wedding, I've never seen that aunt at a wedding. And the other memorial services, never seen that aunt. Anything religious, they don't come. And, and the, so many people came and that the chapel that they had for my uncle's service uh, was full. People were standing there, so they opened this little side room that's usually like a family room. It's off, like right at the side by the casket. And they opened it, and I, those people were sitting so close to me that I didn't want to look at them. Because you, know, you guys are pretty close, but this is like they were right there. I could spit on them. So I didn't want to turn over there and spit on them. So I knew someone was there. And so I just started to share the gospel about the thief on the cross. And I turned to look, and there was my aunt, and there was my cousin, and there was her husband. And I, I almost, I was like, 
I almost was like, you guys are Jehovah's Witnesses. What are you doing in here? Is this, are you guys allowed? I got, I got a Bible. I'm sharing the Word of God. Like, and they listened. They never, I, every time I looked over there, they were looking right at me. And I was explaining grace. It's not by legalism. It's not any other way. Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, died on the cross for our sins. And if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you can be saved from sin. I don't know what, I mean, I tried to talk to them afterwards and had a, and hadn't seen my aunt for a while. I was happy to see her. Um, I never would have thought that. I, in my entire life, I never would have thought that would happen. When you get reconciled with God, guess what happens? You're on God's side. <laughs> you know God has a side? God's doing something, and he has a side. You know how I know? Because I've been not on his side. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And now we're reconciled to God. Paul's not talking about what we're reconciled from. He's talking about now we're reconciled to God. You better buckle up. You're on the train now. God's going somewhere. Something's happening. God's doing something. I'm going to ask you a question. In your life, think about what is, what is it that God, why did God grab hold of you? What does he want to do? If you're still here, what does he want to do? What does he want to do with the rest of your life? Ask him. You're reconciled to him. Say, Lord, as long as I'm still here and you and I are stuck in it together, what are you doing? And watch and see what he does. You're probably going to find that on a fairly regular basis, you're going to see the effects of that reconciliation manifesting in life that leads to that joy that Paul talked about. We've now received this reconciliation, so we rejoice. I mean, I'm, I remember hearing Pastor Chuck talk about... Uh, his expectation on a daily basis, uh, just wondering what God would do, and it was because he understood this truth. Uh, I had such a great example of, as a, of a Christian and of a pastor, and my pastor, in that he was just so expectant. And the reason he was expectant is because that's what the Bible says. He really believed he was reconciled to God, and it meant he was saved to something, and, and that now walking in fellowship with God, who knows what God wants to do? Through any one of us. He can do anything. And uh, it's always uh, so exciting, amazing, joyful uh, to see the effects of that reconciliation as you realize this is Jesus doing something only Jesus could do, and I am stuck to his side. It's like being in a sidecar. You're not driving. Jesus is on the motorcycle, and you're just this happy passenger. He's taking you... And sometimes he goes off-road. Sometimes he ramps it off a ramp. Sometimes it seems like you got severed from the thing and you're like, Where's, where is he? I don't know if you think he lost me. But what Paul says here is just so key. Uh, Much more than having now been justified by his blood will be saved from wrath through him. That's the consequences of sin right now. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, will be saved by His life. That positive salvation being worked out. And not only that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Don't live far away from God. Don't live in a continual state of, man, I just need to get saved from that. I just need to get saved from that. You haven't even started experiencing what the Lord wants to do in your life if you're just in the cycle of, I'm sinning, I'm not sinning, I'm sinning, I'm sinning, I'm not sinning, I'm sinning, I'm sinning. You need to, you need to let the power of the Spirit of God break you out of that. The, the Son came to set you free, and if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed, saved from, but saved too, and start experiencing that life. Father, we, we pray for help. Lord, we're looking at this passage that began with us as helpless, broken down, wounded, beyond repair, uh, ungodly and sinful. And it's these very uh, people, us, the sinful, that now get to be reconciled. And we thank you, Lord, for taking away the guilt and the penalty of sin. But Lord, Paul's talking here about something much more, much more than that. There's a salvation because of the life of Jesus to be experienced that brings joy. Because of reconciliation, there's a, there's a victory over the wrath of God in the sense that those things that we do, the unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, 
that because of our hardness of heart brings the consequences of sin, that we're, we don't have that in our lives. We can turn away from that, and then we instead now have the life of Jesus. So, Lord, pour out your Spirit upon us and awaken us and deliver us from sin. But, Lord, deliver us to the life of Jesus. Help us to walk in the Spirit. Help us, Lord, to, to walk in reconciliation with God and realize there's no barrier there's no reason why I can't pray right now and just see what God wants to do. And Lord, to let you work and let us find uh, all through our day those little things that you might want to accomplish, those, those things that whether they're big or small, that we would walk in that reconciliation, that I know the one that I believe in and he's with me right now and, and I, I want to do what he says the way he says to do it. So help us, Lord. Help us walk that way. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. We're helpless without you. But Lord, you've said you'd make our hearts your home. So Jesus, make yourself right at home in our hearts and, and help us to live, Lord, in your life, your life living in us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.